in the 80s, maybe beforehand, of, of, of how the, the comic book industry was working and, and the stories that were going on, right. and, then, and then this incarnation of Animal Man and how it sort of came about, and perhaps how Grant Morrison was brought in. You touched on it a little bit, but I think that would be useful. Yeah, so in the 80s, DC Comics was looking to reinvigorate their comics. They had a bit of a slump. Uh, eventually, this all sort of, and they, they were having, they had this whole like idea, which eventually became like the crisis of infinite books. Which was this like really weird, mildly incomprehensible <laughs> uh, series about how like they had so many comic books, and they had this idea of, like that they basically all exist on alternate universes. This was like standard canon. All the different, all the different, like, like yeah. stories and, and expansions. Every single comic book that had ever been released was on, was one of these universes. And like, the truth is, this is too many. We yeah. cannot keep track. It's actually of not a bad way to explain it all in a certain sense. Yeah. So, like, for example, the original Superman stuff in the original Justice League was like universe A. I don't remember if that's it might be universe B. I forget. And then the more recent Superman and Batman and such were universe B. You know, and then, you know, the evil, you know, Ultraman and Owlman, you know, their counterparts are, are in universe C or 3, and so on, you know, there is, and there are various different ones that you, you can go through, but the point is, there are a lot of, like, copies and, like, you know, which one is this one, which one is this one, you know, there's a Supergirl here, and there's a Owl Girl here, and there's a Wonder Girl here, and, you know, it's like, well, okay, there's a lot of Supermans and a lot of Superboys, and how do we do and I don't know. It's a weird story, but it's a, just it's the same kind of shtick. You know, there's a giant space monster called the Anti Monitor who wants to like, destroy existence or some crap. I don't remember if that's exactly his plan, but it was some, or maybe he wanted to be an ultimate power. You know, obviously. Yeah. And, it, it, and essentially, that was like a big thing, and it was integrated into a lot of other storylines too, and a lot of other comic books. Essentially, the idea is they were going to collapse a lot of these and just start a bunch of new ones. And one of the ones that was started before this was called Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing was a much older comic book property about a Swamp Thing. They lived in the swamps and like, they interact with like, plants and stuff. It was never the most popular and it was kind of odd, but basically they gave it to this up-and-coming comic book artist, well not artist, author, uh, Alan Moore, and he made it quite popular for an indie comic book. Indie, relatively. He was on the vertical label of DC Comics. So the idea is, the idea is well, let's try to expand this. So they also basically gave this to a couple other people. One of them was Sandman, Neil Gaiman. Sandman was another hardly used character. And of course, Neil Gaiman completely changed it. Like, he basically had the reference to the original hero as being someone who, like, thought he was the original Sandman, but wasn't. <laughs> like, that's how off it was. It was like, no, the Sandman wasn't a superhero. He was this weird, endless being <laughs> that inspired this other guy while he was well, captured. I'll and just say, I haven't finished Sandman yet. I get to do that. To my shame. You already yeah. read some of these pieces. Right. Um, and Alan, and Alan Moore, you know, and, uh, and, and, and that stuff, and then Grant Morrison was invited to Animal Man. And according to him, remember in the, in the like, like the intro or the foreword to the first Animal Man collection, you say how you know, like basically the, the the comic book labels or whatever were were just basically scouring <laughs> scouring the UK for like uh, for for like you know all sorts of curmudgeonly uh, <laughs> curmudgeonly or dark well, like UK yeah, writers. A lot of them. Were so that's kind of how they came. Up. Right. They they were trying to create like new. Inference. They were trying to reinvigorate these characters because nobody cared about the animal man. And, and, and in fairness, his powers, if you just think about it, are kind of stupid. And also, there are a million duplicates. What are his powers? His powers are that he can, if there are animals around, he can absorb their power. If there is a bird, he can fly. Just like a, if there's an elephant, he becomes super strong. You know, if there's a cheetah, he becomes super fast, etc. Uh, and you know, there are some kind of aliens and stuff in his universe. Some of his foes, but it was never a really popular one. And there were a lot of weird stuff in like the 60s and so on. And that came from that era where everyone was trying to come up with like a new, it was even the 50s. There was 
just like, let's let's come up with a new one. Let's uh, another one. Okay, we are because they have so many. They're just trying to come up with. Yeah, it just sounds like it was. A, yeah, it was, it was another thing they created. Just they were creating characters. Yeah, so just four. They just trying to shove, shove them out. Like let's come up with more stuff. And Animal Man was not particularly a popular hero, and that just meant that Grant Morrison had kind of like carte blanche what he wanted. As long as he didn't screw with any of the existing heroes, which he did not, he could essentially do whatever he wanted. So that was kind of what, where he started. And I don't know, how much, how much do you spoilers are you getting? Yeah, we should do spoilers with Animal Man. But right. Yeah. So he started sort of like an interesting way. Just like, all right, he's struggling with like trying to like figure out his place in the world. It's like he wants to be a superhero. And this sort of takes place after the crisis, where it's sort, of, and it's sort of like, he's trying to, and he's like, not quite, not all his powers working, and he's just trying to figure out what his role will be, and he's trying to help out, and he gets into some sort of moral and ethical situations. Like, immediately, he starts having to deal with, like, an animal testing facility. And Which is a good some, start. Like, yeah, it's a good, it's it's a good a, way to bring it in, I you know, just to something bigger, yeah. Because, like, it's not just as simple as, like, oh, well, there are good guys and there are bad guys, and maybe some of these people are doing things that are ethically shady, as it turns out they are. It's not to say that all animal testing is necessarily like that, but certainly that is the point that Grant Morrison is kind of making, and he gets more and more, like, you know, you know PETA, 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 like animal rights. And, and he literally, at the end, like, he, like, he tells the audience, that? like, and he gives their address in D.C. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Oh, which is kind of funny, just because yeah. you know he, he was always kind of like pushing that you know my subtext throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but I like well, well, I was gonna say I liked at the end, like he was like saying, yeah, I thought it was gonna get kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he said that. So, so, so before we go to like Grant Morrison and talk a little more about like Animal Man itself, and just just to close out what we were talking about with the uh, with the context of the eighties, what I find interesting is just a few things. I mean. First of all, you have this like trifecta. Um, I'm sure if they're like comic book nerds, there may be some other writers at the time. I mean, I think Mark Miller is supposed to be one of those who sort of push things a little bit, maybe. Not a bunch of his stuff, except for what he did with Grant Morrison called Scroll Cold Crew, which is okay, in my opinion. But, but um, it's interesting how like the 80s like produced these like, with, like they gave these, it's like they gave these like these three like kind of off the beaten path, you could say, or unique writers from the UK forgotten, uh, almost forgotten properties. I know that those are probably not the only uh, like sort of forgotten properties they gave to authors during that time. It's like these three different authors, uh, you know, Grant Morrison, Neil Gaiman, and and Alan Moore, they gave the three of them like the, 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 those those almost forgotten characters. And and first of all, these these properties kind of you know catal- catal- catalyzed their career, or at least had a huge hand in their career, in each, in each of those three um, authors' careers, and and in each of them kind of reshaped the respective genres and heavily influenced the different genres that they worked in. I mean, I mean well, Neil, Neil Gaiman, I mean, Sandman is considered one of the greatest um, comic book series of all time, and then Neil Gaiman, you know, he didn't really s- stay with a lot of um, uh, comic books. You know, his, you know, his fiction, you know, he was... He was, he's one of the people who's redefined fantasy. And Alan Moore, you know, by creating Watchmen and Mew Vendetta, just these monumental, like, culturally influential works, you know, and completely changed comics, too. And, like, and then Grant Morrison, who, you know, you know, there's, like, you know, he contends that, that the Wachowskis, like, you know, may have, he says they kind of pushed his ideas for The Matrix, you know, and he used that to, to make The Matrix. Um, but, you know, whether that's true or not, definitely his stuff, his work, and pushing kind of that psychedelic stuff and, and, and all that, you know, changed a lot of, like, writing and action stuff. And then, at the very least, he's been very active in the comic book world. And, you know, so... so yeah, he's worked on both Marvel and DC. Right. So, like, they, they all, these things launched their careers. They had a big influence on, on uh, the, you know, on what a so superhero is. Guys. What? Both Neil Gaiman and Alan Moore were involved in work. Right, 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 and, and I'm saying so. So I, th- I think, I think that's, I think that's pretty cool and worth noting. And, and they all are into challenging the 
medium and the genre while still showing a love for it in different ways. You know, I mean, Alan Moore is, you know, Alan, Alan Moore, like, often gets into, like, that, like, really gritty, like, what it means to be human thing and bring as much to a human level and just really these deep literary things like Neil Gaiman is just, like, you know, he's he's all about, like, the mythology and, like, and, like, what does it mean to, like, have, like, something you worship or not and, like, what are these different states, you know, like, these mythological worlds, what, what would that really mean? And then, of course, it's just, like, let me, let me fuck with your brain and, you know, and, uh, and what does that mean when you fuck with, when you fuck with your brain? Right, so he so, starts yeah. that and, in the, in the, like, pretty early in the right. song, but, right. but it's called the Coyote Mask, which, as it turns out, is a metaphor for the entire thing, and now right. that you've finished it, you right. know that that's true. Right. Uh, yeah, I just finished it. That's I just finished it like an hour or so ago. All of them. Yeah, so, yeah, because there's this whole thing about there's this weird coyote and it's like walking on its hind legs. And then you see this weird flashback in a kind of Looney Tunes way that this coyote essentially sacrificed his life. He left. You know, he wanted to. He wanted to stop all the violence in this sort of Warner Brothers like universe. He goes through the creator, you know, who's like, who has like a pen, and it's like, interesting. And, you know, the animal man wants to help, but he doesn't know how. So it's sort of interesting because he's confronting his creator to try to save the animals, to try to make a peace with the animals. So it's a sort of an interesting thing that he just introduces the discos. Uh, and then if you see at the end, I'm like, I don't know, it kind of fades away into someone and actually drawing them. And around that time, Grant Morrison starts hammering in them. Now, you may not notice these things because you just read it, but rereading it, you notice, like, he has, like, all these like, references, like, on green type, it turns out, you see him writing on the computer. You see, like, he, there's this weird, like, there's this, like, talking, like, you know, I used to have an imaginary fox named Foxy. And you're like, who's talking? <laughs> like, what, what is this? Is he a man? I don't understand. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it turns out like, it is Grant Morrison right. talking to us. Yeah. It, 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 there's so much this meta stuff uh, peppered in. So it's like all throughout these different stories as Animal Man is kind of there are all these layers. So Animal Man is sort of fighting crime like this, this you know the theme most of the time or the thread that runs through a lot of the crime and you know, the crime that he's fighting so to speak are you know people who are who are uh, you know, who are mistreating animals, maybe they're going whaling, or doing animal testing, as you were saying, just, just different things like that, or, or humans acting indecently in general, and, you know, stuff like that, and, and, and then, and then the, but, like, through that, he's kind of first of all questioning who he is, whether he wants to be a superhero, so there's that questioning stuff, but then as time goes on, you know, he and his wife, because he has a wife and he's raising kids, he and his wife are sort of like, weird stuff is happening, like, what's happening that, like, apparitions show up, and it's kind of weird because, like, at first when I was re- when I was gonna read it, I was I kept hearing that Animal Man had these like meta things going on, and I did know about the spoil- spoiler, which is fine. The choice that he that he, you know in the end he actually meets Grant Morrison, you know, he meets his maker, so to speak, the author. And and but I was thinking, I was thinking, like, what's the connection, to Animal Man? What does that do with anything meta? And so Grant Morrison just does a really good job at like just pacing and just hammering in, and he keeps it's like he keeps going. Going, not even deeper, like it's like he keeps like breaking through. The Animal Man keeps breaking through different layers of like reality above him. Yeah. To, like just understanding more, the yeah. reality he's in. Yeah, just keeps understanding just that he is in a comic book, essentially. Right, right. You know, it's sort of like the, which is kind of like a, a very interesting idea to write a character that knows he's in. Right, you know, and so, you know, that, it's sort of like it's the kind of thing that can influence the way you think about things. Like, do you imagine? Like the universe inside your head, and you're talking to people inside your head. Yeah. You know, do they realize it's fictional, or are you only thinking that they realize it's fictional? Yeah. And super trippy because it's like he it, like it's like you're seeing uh, you're literally reading a thing in a comic book, but it's like at certain points it's like the like you can tell like the comic book like the, the, the characters, Animal Man of course the most, but various characters become you know aware that there's like someone watching them and they start looking at you you know but they, they can't quite make you out they say you're like a blurry face or something like that right. so it's kind of cool but it's kind of trippy because you're like because this is still literally on you know a comic, comic page 
pages, and they're talking about how they can see you, but it's someone writing that can see you, and then there are these, there are a bunch of scenes where you, you see someone writing on a computer, like, close up on a computer, you know, <laughs> being written on an animal, so it's like, all these, like, layers of, like, you know, and mirror so, looking into a mirror, looking into a mirror, that sort of thing, which I guess is called mirror magic. There's a lot of callbacks. Like, I, if you may remember, there was a whole scene earlier on where there were a bunch of Fenigarians who were, like, the clock people and during an invasion. He talks a little bit about how, like, he had to integrate that into his storyline. Mary Morrison said that. Yeah. Because uh, that was something that was going on, so he had to write about it. And then there's, like, the whole thing where he's like, all you had to do was switch it off. Which goes on to the very end of the comics, where he says, "I have help with the bomb." Yeah. He said, "All you had to do was switch it off," which is sort of like it's like a message to himself, you know, from a from the comic book. Sort of so do what? Just that's how he does it. Just turn it off. You're fine. That's how you save the day. Just turn off the bomb. Right. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because you have essentially these two other characters that are introduced. That start having a role, and, you, and we keep cutting through. There's this guy. There's this Doctor Highwater. He's like a Native American you know, psychologist or something, a sociologist. He keeps talking about what he's doing. He's a physicist. He's a quantum physicist. And he's trying to understand the nature of his reality. And he keeps talking about something called the implicate order, and he basically comes to this realization that he's they're living in a fictional reality. Well, this doesn't come until later. But there's also this other guy who is the Psycho Pirate. The Psycho Pirate was involved in the crisis on infant threats. He was essentially the guy who was working for the Internet Monitor. So you always got to have one of those guys. He had these masks that could change people's emotions, essentially, so you could manipulate people that way. And blah, blah, blah. He had, essentially, he absorbed an enormous amount of you know, energy and everything that the universe is combined, and he's the only one that remembers the crisis, essentially. So he kind of, he's crazy, because he remembers all these other possibilities at once. And throughout this comic, he's, like, realizing, he keeps talking about how we're in a comic as well, in a sense. Like, he's like, you know, uh, I know you're trying to make me confused, but he's talking to Grant Morrison. Oh, oh right, yeah, well, that's what he's doing, okay. Yeah, that's it. it's like, you're trying you're trying to make me trying to make it hard for me to think. You're very that's trippy. <laughs> you write a character that accuses you of stuff, of, yeah. of being an asshole to your to itself. Um, so there's a lot of like circular stuff there. Then there's the weird aliens. What do you think about those aliens? Well, so those aliens have existed in, in, in the DC world, right? They're just like are they, they were like, animal man's like, antagonists, like in the beginning. Right, no, no, no but have they already exist in the DC world? Isn't there? Yeah, I just told you. Now. They were Animal Man's antagonists. Oh, so they didn't exist in any other story? If they did, it would have been very funny. But the point is, oh, like... Oh, those are the aliens. He got, yeah, he got, like, his powers from, like, an alien ship. In the, in the original Animal Man, right? right? And those were the aliens that were involved. And so Grant Morrison integrated them into making like, a new version of things. Right. Yeah. Which he comments on, in a, in a sense, yeah. throughout the whole thing. Yeah, so those aliens are interesting, because he, he, at one point, you know, with, with the... the Bizarre throwback character, Hamid Ali, the man who never dies. Right. You know, they make a comment like, listen, we are agents of the power that brings your world into being, which means they're agents of Grant Morrison. <laughs> so that's why they can just, like, erase Hamid Ali. He's like, dude, no. <laughs> You're a stupid character. And we, I think we all realize that. Yeah. <laughs> the way he says that. Like, that they say that they're, like, you're from an older time and minor character, like... You know, dramatic, and yeah, fast, it's like... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And he, and he is, like, a cruel, awful person, so... Um, but, like, yeah. I yeah, mean, exactly. It's, it's just, like, it's, he has no complexity in any sense. Yeah. I mean, so, so I think, you know, thinking about just, just Grant Morrison in general, over the course of... I, you've read more of Grant Morrison than I have, probably just by a little bit, just, you know, it's hard to say... I haven't read Doom Patrol yet, uh, or All Star Superman, but like, you know, I went, I, I, well, let me think of how to say this, how to, how to start this thread of conversation. I, I, um, yeah, this is, Animal Man is considered, even though it was like, you know, it's kind of his debut work, it is considered one of his best, um, you know, 
was uh, you know it's his best work. Some people say it's the best. I wouldn't say that it's only standalone. best and nothing is better. But I I now sort of see why, um, and, uh, and and there and there are reasons for why it's considered at least one of his uh, best. And you know, just just thinking about Grant Morrison in general, just I like, to reflect. You mentioned how you got into Grant Morrison. I mean, I I found out about him originally again through New X Men when you had when you had that when you had right. that series. And I, think, I and I would say in some sense that that's probably my favorite because um, he just does a bunch of awesome stuff with, with X Men. And he does do some kind of trippy stuff that's grounded. Like, you know, that's just what got me into comics to begin. Right, right. No, it was, it was, just, it was just, it was just, it was fantastic. And, 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 um, you know, he, Grant Morrison is interesting. And, and you know, you, know, you and I have talked, have spoken a lot, a lot, probably even in our previous podcast, like Alan Moore versus uh, Grant Morrison podcast. Um, we, we, we spoke a little about this, but like, Grant Morrison is kind of, um, I, I don't want to say he sort of is hit or miss, actually, in, in a sense. Yeah, that's um, true. Because like he's he's clearly very talented in a lot of ways, and and, um, and, and he's also he, capable and, of writing coherent. Right, and I and I and, and I think he's one of these examples of he is just he knows the form so inside and out, and you know, and and he also. Know, you know, he's, he's been very open about his experimentation with, with psychedelics, but also just his, in general, you know, views about spirituality and different dimensions and things like that and magic and chaos magic and all that stuff that that it's like, in some sense, it, I feel like it's hard for him, perhaps, I don't know if this is true about it, to like take what the, the regular form of things seriously. And so I think, you know, his strength, as we've talked about, is... He's really good at articulating through the comic book medium, and even just sometimes in his pure just writing, the, the letter, the, the, the written word, articulating and somehow describing and showing the experience of mind alteration and dimension, dimensional bending. But uh, but he's uh, but but uh, I, I you and I often agree that he's I think often at his best when he's grounded a little bit with some with with some constraints um you know it, it kind of reminds me of how like i heard you know dan Harmon talking about when writing rick and morty what he what he says he's like he said you know it's not like dan Harmon isn't super creative but just Royland's sort of it seems like he sort of thought of as this kind of like mad erratic genius in a, in a sense yeah. even though he knows how to write too obviously being coherent um but i think there's some truth to it so the two of them together when they write rick and morty um you know dan Harmon has said he's like I like being the boring one to the story. I like I, I like grounding the story. I think that's one of the reasons why Rick and Morty does really well because they have all this stuff with challenging. You know, the, the, there's like just fucked up stuff where they're like, you know, really mind be- mind bending, dimension bending, and what that means. But they they still had some through lines going through. So anyway, I think with Grant Morrison, sometimes he could use a little bit of that. And yeah, so but let me yeah let me make a comment on this. Yeah. There's there's different levels of metafiction because. As I th- as I mentioned to you before, metafiction is a museum. yeah. The idea of breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, it's not only talking about breaking the fourth wall. It's theater itself. No, I'm not talking about breaking. The so yeah. when you get into like people who are the idea that somehow the characters on the page, you know, or in a movie are inherently aware of the medium that they're in, it's very different. Like you have Zach Morris on Saved by the Bell, changing, changing time, but the truth is. He really is also subject to the rules of the place that he's in. It doesn't, it's like, it's all fantastical in a sense. But for the most part, it's like, oh, it's just like a little conceit. We talk to the audience. Haha, right. uh-huh. time out, time in. Right. And that's, and it's not mentioned. No, they didn't. It's not a super deep show. So they weren't like thinking like that either. But also, just like many, many characters, like Ferris Bueller's The Off, talk to the camera. But on the other hand, again, he is subject to the rules. You know, and I would say the closest you get to this kind of thing is Deadpool, sort of, that he seems like he's aware that it's all a con, and he can somehow use that to a certain extent. Right. But the fact that it's comical, kind of, in, in some yeah. sense, grounds in the sense you're like, it's not so mind bending, so, so that, that kind of eases it in the reader's mind, and, and it's super enjoyable, obviously, um, with, with Deadpool. Yeah, but my point is not just about the meta aspect, I'm talking about just the fact that. 
even when even when Grant Morrison's not being meta, he'll have these. Um, he'll have you know we, <laughs> how many <laughs> like how many uh, and I'm not against this by any means, but how many stories has he had where someone takes peyote or, or some sort of hallucinogen or psychedelic? I mean, he has so many of that that he'll yeah. he'll show that trip. He's not the only author who's done that, obviously, but um. There's the amazing sequence, and I was, and I was amazing in *V for Vendetta*, the graphic novel spoilers, where the detective you know, trips acid at that one sort of former concentration, uh, you know, laboratory concentration right. laboratory thing. Um, but yeah, but like, but the thing is, it, like my, my, but like, some of those things you're saying, or was the point you're making is that th- those other examples are like a little more grounded than uh, is out there. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Because it's right. Like the right. point is, the animal man, he is explicitly having a character gain an awareness, right, in a way that is very different from almost any other. Right. Hard, I'm hard pressed to think of something like that. I think there are other places, like novels, of like books, where there are characters who know they're in and like try to talk to the author or talk to the hero. Then that happens. Uh, I mean, you know, these, these things go on. Here and there, I mean, the, I remember that was like actually something in like fan fiction where you have the author talk to people. Uh, and, you know, there are little things like that. I mean, Winnie the Pooh had a bit of that. I, yeah. I would say that in a weird way, that's almost closer than Bubba than Deadpool. And that like Winnie the Pooh is kind of explicitly in a book. Right. The words are hitting you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the narrator is, ex- is explicitly talking to them, calls himself the narrator. Yeah, <laughs> and like at one point, tips the book over to get Tigger out of a tree. You know, that's that's pretty mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, exactly. It, it, it's great. It's great. No, that's fantastic. But 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 the, the, the thing is, is is you know, so it, contrasted with something like Saved by the Bell or even Winnie the Pooh, yeah. or Deadpool is uh, is Graham Morrison can push the limit of the crazy mind bending stuff, interdimensional stuff going on, um, and still somehow articulate it, except there are plenty of times, as you and I both, both agree, where we think he goes too far into that, and he has trouble reeling it back in, you're like, well, what the fuck is he talking about? Like, and he goes on for oh, yeah. too long, and you're like, oh, yeah. where is this, where was this, that looks like an image that was in a past, you know, that was in a past, like, a, 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 a past story, a past issue, but what are you talking about? I mean, and, and so, like, even so, so man, there's probably more well, yeah. times. Animal Man like, has a little bit, but I think I think part of it, so so in a sense what was good with Animal Man is that I think it was his first you know, since his first sometimes that just happens, your your rookie effort, his first big thing he, he really knocked it out of the park and a lot of things came together and you know, he had some of the constraints for that was you know, I and mean, I, I actually don't know what was going on in his head, obviously, but like you know, he was still trying to figure out, you know, probably you know, trying to explore himself as an author and then and then, you know, Maybe he maybe he did tone down some of the uh, some of the crazy stuff, you know, to make it more palatable. Maybe he was told to, well, or, or or maybe he he or maybe he was in the process of pushing, and just some of that stuff was already there, the constraints. But he, but like, but, 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 but give me a second. I'll just talk about like like the differences between Animal Man in this regard and then other stuff. Like Animal Man, like he, in Animal Man, he just paces. He does a really good job at pacing the, I mean, not, not all the time, but and sometimes he spends too long in the crazy uh, mind-altering world. For the most part, he does a good job at pacing, like, how, like, over time, Animal Man, as I said before, his perception and, you know, his doors of perception keep getting wider and wider. He's noticing more and more. He he literally is, is looking away from the literal comic book frames that he's in yeah. more and more. He's stepping outside of it. It's like he's. It's like in the Matrix. This was pre the Matrix. You can actually how, influence eventually. Right. That's what's right. Like well, that, that's the thing. So it's like in, in the in the Matrix how like the spoilers. Neo. <laughs> 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 you know, Neo. Neo is getting better and better at at like challenging his reality, and you know, like you know, he's, he is the very end where he actually has the full blown. Uh, you know, epiphany, realization, all that, but he's getting better and better. Same thing in Animal Man, in a different way, and, he, and it, you know, it's pretty genius, I'd say, how Grant Morrison literally, as you said, as you said, has Animal Man go in and out of the frames and uses that to fight 
some villains, but, you know, it just moves through different worlds and realities. And then, you know, like, the, 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 the word, like, you actually have to do, in order to, like, there's that one page where, like, the, the, the dialogue boxes, like, start, like, like shifting around in different directions. Yeah. You actually have to physically move either yourself or the book to read what's going on. But again, he paces it really well, and it just builds up to him finally meeting Grant Morrison. And and even at the end, the climax, it's like it's the Grant Morrison character explains the whole meta thing. He explains it in actually a way that grounds it. Like we were talking earlier about, like you and I before the podcast, we were talking about how like he even says like he even tells Animal Man, you're you know you know like like you're in the real world or like or like you know you don't actually come to the real real world. I come from the real world. But this is not actually the real world. I have to make a. You can't even. I don't know. You can't even come to the real world. I'm just making a fake real world where I can talk to you. So it's just this crazy trippy scene, but he grounds it and, and, and uses it kind of as a you know sort of like commentary on on authors and himself and you know what direction the comic book medium and the superhero should go in. And I like what he does there. Now the Invisibles, on the other hand, it's not the only example, but we always say how like the Invisibles. The first three Invisibles, first three volumes, are, I think, really solid, and it's probably what really got me, made me a Grant Morrison fan, and it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's cool, it, like, follows this cool story of this, this like, rebel group of, uh, you know, like, like, uh, dimension traveler warriors, or whatever they are, right. and it's cool and grounded in a certain way, but still, still being crazy and out there, and afterwards, it's just, like, it, it really is, like, you know, he, 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 he said that he was, like, on different hallucinogens or whatever, he's on acid, I think, or, or something, or a bunch of stuff. Um, like, when he was writing The Invisibles, and it seems like it, because it's like, after that volume, it just, the, the, the narrative just scatters in a thousand directions. It's like, what's going on? He, and at times, he sort of brings it back a little bit, but not by much. And then in Seven Soldiers 2, like, I felt like the first two volumes, maybe, were were grounded, and like, and like good, but, but then, but then course, that also sort of like, Fragmented, and the filth had some cool stuff, but there were some parts that filth where you're like, "What the hell is going on?" Yeah. So, new X Men, Animal Man, parts of Invisibles, and I haven't read All Star Superman. Um, I feel like those things, where he's had some of those constraints, have really helped him. You well, know, Super Gods because it's you know well, that's fiction a, yeah. is actually pretty well written. Yeah, it's, it's coherent. You know, he gets into like some. Like interesting theories and stuff, but it's never a point where he's like, and then the substrate t- came out of the his substrate mouth. came from the from the multi dimension and and blew me up out of out of blowing up right. the dimension. And the omnibetical <laughs> serpent <laughs> it came out, he opened its mouth, and inside its mouth was the opposite of its mouth. <laughs> <laughs> the super chaos, super chaos, onto the super chaos order. <laughs> and it, inside of its little eye, such a tiny little doll version of me. <laughs> that doll version waved at me and said, Hello, Grant. He said, this, you know, And he said, You yeah, fucking chore. <laughs> what are you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> Yeah, so Supergod's pretty good. You know, it, it is not. There's no, you know, there's no pictures. <laughs> it's a book that is uh, filled with words. But it's it's very interesting because I, I I think some of the stuff he wrote in Supergod is really spot on, as they would say. Like he talks about how like the integration of the restrictive comics code led to some really bizarre stories. When 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 history and why? In, in the comic books. Like, the comics code was sort of like with the MPAA, you know, with, you know, the three ratings, where essentially... Wait, the 50s you're talking about? You're talking about the yeah, time? Yeah. Where they basically said, hey, uh... Get these commie comic books out of here. <laughs> well, there was a little bit of that, too, yeah. but uh, there was, some, you know, there was, like, all sorts of panics and stuff, and they, you know, it became like, oh, they're corrupting our children. Now, in fairness, there really, like, was no, like... There's no quality control at the time. So you had like things like Tales from the Crypt and all sorts of like, horror comics and murder comics and mystery comics. Some of these really were not good for kids, but you know, a lot of them were just like, whatever, people were reacting to something. The comics club was very restrictive. As a 
a side point. George R. R. Martin's talked about that a lot. Like, 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 oh, yeah, he just he was not a fan. Yeah. Right? Like, there were things, for example, in the earliest versions, they lessened and lessened and lessened, and finally, nobody cared eventually uh, over time. But there was, like, you couldn't portray, like, a politician or a police officer negatively. You know, you couldn't have people fighting. Like, they couldn't actually fight with, like, fists. And so, like, how do, you, so how do you have Superman or Batman without fighting? So you ended up with really stupid plots instead. So they, they, came, they figured out ways around it, but you ended up with really bizarre stories. So one of the things Morris had wrote about, like, Batman and Robin is there was a big gay panic about them. <laughs> and they ended up writing, he said, so he said they ended up integrating, like, a bat woman and a bat girl character. And he said, but crazy, bizarre like, pseudo Freudian nonsense that these, you know, whatever these writers' drugs were on, who knows, but they wrote some crazy stuff. And he said, they were so bizarre that if anything could turn someone gay, those comics would play them down the track. <laughs> the one that, <laughs> just, it's just like, it's, it's bizarre because, like, they had, they ended up writing, like, really over the top campy stuff because they were restricted because they couldn't write. Obviously, they were trying to. Grandma was really not saying that, but that's the same guy. Kind of but it's, that was a sort of an interesting thing. You know, Grant Morrison's always been a very progressive guy. You know, like, he was a big fan of, you know, GI stuff. Like, like, when he was a kid, American troops were coming into, like, you know, Scotland bringing, like, chocolate and comic books and stuff. Oh, really? Yeah, that's kind of, like, where he got, like, a lot of his love for that stuff. And this was, like, he wasn't alive for why, why, why were they coming to Scotland at that time? They were just helping it out. They were, remember, there was a lot of destruction. You know? Oh, wait, so he grew up like in, I think he was kid mostly in the 70s, something like that? Yeah, yeah. Morrison, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so, I mean, I'm wondering if he was kid. Yeah, I mean, I, I, listen, I, I, don't, I don't really know my Scottish history that well. But, uh, I mean, I, I think I've heard him talk about that. So, I mean, like. He was in his 20s and the 80s. Right, so he grew up in like the seventies, maybe a little bit more so in the sixties. Doesn't mean there there weren't issues. Also, in the seventies, I'm pretty sure. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm pretty sure he lived in, but probably the effect of Scotland had some um, economic like depressions and things like that. I mean, that's yeah, you know, like you talked about. Yeah, well, well, because well, you know, London was one of the main one of the reasons I know. It's also just being a punk uh, a punk rock fan, like like. Um, that's sort of where, where like, punk rock in, in the U.K. flourished and kind of originated, sort of originated there and in New York um, uh, because of, like, the economic kind of depression that was going on there in the 70s. So I guess there were, there were economic issues in America, too, at the time. Um, so yeah, well, there's other other uh, animal man things I'm going to bring up. So one of them is the overman idea. Now, obviously, the overman, you know, is, like, an explicit translation of Uber of Mitch. That's exactly what it means, and it's sort of like it's definitely a very you know it's it's funny because now that we're talking about it, it does seem like it's the, the if you took like we got to write an adult version of Superman, it's like the most extreme version of that, like a guy who's the result of military experiments and you know and ends up you know, succumbing to a sex virus and goes crazy and su- suicidal and homicidal and wants to destroy the world. Yeah. You know, and, you were saying you were thinking it might be something about Watchmen. I think it's really about that, about the dark you know, it's like the ultra dark thing. I don't really think it's about Watchmen. I understand what you're saying about the military experiments thing, but he doesn't really see. Yeah, like I was, Jeremy was talking about that was making a comment when he, because I know that Graham, that Graham Morrison has sometimes made some kind of barbed comments about yeah, Alan Moore. Um, Watchmen specifically. Yeah. Because he does like, he so, does like some of his other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the way they made it, 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 maybe talk about this in our, our podcast about Graham Morrison previously, but the, the, the big thing is that sort of the point of, point of contention, and I'm not sure if I've heard Alan Moore say anything about Graham Morrison, but yeah. Graham yeah. Morrison, oh yes, okay. Well, one thing Graham Morrison said, it's not the only thing, only thing he said about Alan Moore, because he also said later on that Alan Moore kind of like stole his like, his like psychedelic interdimension, interdimensional uh, ideas or whatever. And to Graham Morrison's credit, we both said that we think Graham Morrison's better at the kind of trippy stuff in general than, than Alan Moore is. But anyway, um, one one uh, critique that 
that Grant Morrison has had about Alan Moore is that Alan Moore, um, you know, kind of did he write that in Super Gods that, that Alan Moore kind of like cheapened what the superhero is like the aspirational well it's inspirational yeah, a- aspect of, of doesn't of have it. a strong opinion about Watchmen. Now it's funny because well let me give you two points. Out there. Grant Morrison asserts that Alan Moore put Watchmen in it's like I don't it. that's it. I've done it. Superman, superheroes are done, damn it. Yeah. But the truth is, Alan Moore later went back and wrote more superhero stuff. Yeah, I don't think And not only right. that, I mean, not only that, but Alan Moore has also said he thinks Watchmen is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Moore is, so maybe they are on the same page, if you really want to be honest. It's just yeah, Alan Moore doesn't want to hear someone else say that Watchmen's overrated. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think, I think, I think, I think Grant Morrison's Grant, Grant Morrison's like critiques of Alan Moore, like I, I don't agree with, with Grant Morrison what he's saying. Like I like Grant Moore, like I like Grant Morrison's perspective. I don't want him to be a copy of Alan Moore, but like I don't in general in general agree with him. Also, Alan Moore is a gigantic uh, comic book fan and loves superheroes. I just think he's a huge. Yes, he, he, he's just a like I don't know between the two of them who knows more about comic books, but it but it, I don't know. But it would be really it would be difficult to know. This. Yeah. Alan Moore is this like I consider him a literary genius. I really do, and he writes these, these, these like when he's when he's when he's when he's, when he's doing things well, he writes these like beautiful, you know, complex, dense, comprehensive, you know, just just uh, stories. Well um, thought out with, with, with it, or yeah, or at least well thought out. I mean, you know, top ten is beautiful in a different way, you know, obviously, yeah. but 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 um, uh, you know. Uh, so, so I, I don't think it matters what he's writing. You know, he, like he can he can write something that's clearly superheroes, and he has done that without breaking them down that they're not that they're just these messed up people. You know, he's re- he's just good at getting to really the personal and what's and what's weak about people. And you know, he's just he's good about it. Now, now, Grant Morrison, in general, Grant Morrison has a more optimistic slant on things, though. And that was one thing I was noticing, and I, and I was telling you before. Jeremy, is that it, like I, I was noticing with Drew Man, for instance, and I think in general this is the case of Grant Morrison. Grant Morrison, uh, more often I notice has has examples of happy couples, you know, together, happy romantic couples, whether they have families or not, even if they have issues, you know, he he has that more often happening in his stuff, and he is more of a, a positive, optimistic slant. I think with a lot of things, and Alan Moore. I notice in a lot of his stories, he has you know, you know, break you know, you know, bad marriages, bad you know, bad well, relationships. Not, break, not not exclusively, not exclusively. Um, and he well, doesn't do it in a right. cheap way. But I'm just saying, like, like I like I think maybe that if I'm trying to sort of think analytically, um, you know, I don't I don't know what they're like personally necessarily, but like, but 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 I think in general, Graham Morrison. <laughs> Grant Morrison is trying to push the like what can superheroes and then in turn humanity do and, and create and make better. And Alan Moore, I think he has that, but Alan Moore really sheds this like light of all this dark stuff. However, to be fair, the you know, the iconic image of you know the Be Frendetta Guy Fox mask is way more pervasive in in uh, in, in in culture. You know, and in the world, uh, than uh, probably anything that Grant Morrison has made, unless well, you. Well, but in you know, fairness, yeah. that's because it's from the movie. Yes, but I, but it comes from Al Moore. Yes, no, that's true. But, well, I understand, but, but that movie would not have been made without. Had any movies made about the yeah, Morrison. unless you believe the Matrix <laughs> that they, they, they took. And if you ideas. want to put it that way, then he has a pretty <laughs> right. So that's the only way you can say that. But like. I don't have a dog in that fight. Like I, I, I personally am like I don't know what the you know what the Wachowskis were doing or not, how much they took or not. I know what Grant Morrison has said, and um, I know that I love the first Matrix and the Animatrix. So, you know, not all the Animatrix, but a lot of it. Yeah, overall, good, good body of work. Funny, I don't want to give you too much of a tangent, but I, I was just listening to people saying that they thought the Animatrix was bad. Well, they're wrong. I mean, people are entitled to have incorrect opinions. I mean, Matrix has its issues, uh, but in general, it's very, very strong. First, yeah, uh, the sequels have moments and right. pieces, but they also have a lot of 
Blech. But anyway, so one of the great things about the Overman ending is like he kills Overman by trapping in between the panels of the comic book. Not between, though, the panels get smaller. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. he disappears in yeah. nothingness between the panels. Yeah. And the Yellow Man kind of controls it. Yeah. Which is cool. Like he's kind of like gaining power over the reality. Because remember, they were talking about his morphogenetic, you know, you know, capabilities. Like, that's what his power is. And so it seems like it's saying it's not just about animals. He is the animal man, but that gives him more than just power over, like, animals, but also power over reality, in a sense. Because he's able to, the morphogenetic, you know, they say, like, he's controlling himself throughout by controlling what he's around. It's very interesting from that sense, you know, and I I liked all of the stuff at the end when he's, like, walking through, like, the area of, like, the limbo of, like, all the lost things. Of course, ironically, the funny thing about limbo, because it's all these forgotten characters, is by mentioning them, they're not in limbo anymore. Right, 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 right. <laughs> And he doesn't, he doesn't really address that. Yeah. But oh, what is the most interesting is Mr. Freeze is there. Yeah, that was great. And I did not expect that. And the truth is, yeah, at the time, Mr. Freeze was a forgotten guy. Yeah. Well, that, the that was the thing. series totally brought him back. Right, right. That, that was the only thing when I was reading it. was like, I'm forgotten. And Mr. Freeze, I'm forgotten. And then I was thinking, like, oh, I totally know who Mr. Freeze is. But it's, you know, he may have even been a Mr. Freeze. I feel like I knew a Mr. Freeze before that the series came out. I could, I could be wrong. I could, I could be wrong. Well, you know what? There might have been, there might have been, like, an action figure. You know, yeah, but that a, was a from Mr. the show. Well, when did when did the animated series? Do you know the animated it was like series? The early nineties. All right, so maybe. And then the yeah, late nineties yeah, so. was Batman and Robin, where they copied and destroyed the character of Mr. Freeze. Yeah, the only thing awesome about it is that it, had, it, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger. All right, everyone. All right, everyone. Chill. Chill. <laughs> Especially my wife, who is who is dying. Oh no, she is dead. She has been bought all the ice. <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> yeah, I was just telling someone last night about uh, the whole like the projector stopping. You know, uh, yeah. when we watched that. That's such a good thing. <laughs> yeah, so that, yeah, that's interesting just because I mean I recognize some of these other uh, lesser known things just because I've read a huge amount of comic book crap. And there's some weird obscure things I've read. There was like the Bizarro comics. Oh yeah. That, that B character in there and it was like, oh yeah, him. Like, 
pushing the boundaries with meta is while still keeping like, like, like he doesn't he doesn't write immersive theater like maybe one day he would like he doesn't like you know there there are some there's, there you know there's some forms of things in video games in a sense you could say is sort of maybe, but but not, what I'm saying is within the form that he has that he, that he does it in a, the comic book medium where he's still looking at literal pages the fact that he can translate that stuff that has done it effectively before um, in a palatable way while still pushing it and kind of bending your mind a bit. Um, challenging stuff while you still enjoy the story. The fact that he's even done that, like, at all, and has done it just a few times, is a huge achievement. So, so, I mean, so yeah, so, I mean, so, so, I mean, people try to do the meta thing, like, you're trying to be writing it and, and all that, and, 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 you know, people do this whole people, thing of the stories and the stories, and, and he's, and he's yeah, just, I mean, he's so good at, like, just getting to the root, and it's like, it's like, when he does it well, especially the Animal Man, it's like, he got to that line of, like, it's like he was just, just at the line of, like, what is the creator and the author making something? What is the audience? And what is the actual, like, entertainment or media experience? What is that? Oh my god, you know this, you know what I realized? You could make a great animal man. You know, you don't have to, you, can, you don't have to do everything to see if you, you wouldn't be able to. You cut out a lot of this. Right. You could make a really interesting, metafictional movie, as in, like, he kind of realizes he in the movie right. about superheroes. Right. Because like, you could even put it in the Batman Superman universe. And, yeah. like, cause now that we already That's have, their like, answer to Deadpool. Squad, it should be their answer to Deadpool. Yes, it is <laughs> totally their answer to Deadpool. Not Suicide yeah. Squad, which is right. actually their answer to Guardians of the Galaxy. But, uh, oh my god, DC Comics, Get on you're on. not going to hear us, but Animal Man, classic Animal Man, can just be written make it like a modern version of it. And you keep it in because DC's also usually more dark. You know, that's yeah, the thing. So, well that. Yeah. And, you know, you can make it great in art if you want to. But, you know, you can get it, you know, you can have some people you know, you know, be a Think the right person is still working for you. <laughs> Just get them to write the damn screenplay and then get someone else to, like, translate it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, well, exactly. Oh, I think, I, all right. There we that's go. A, I think that's a good place to Yeah, that's good. That's a good, that's a, that's a good note. You know, as much as we can get Quality Graham Morrison stuff out there, the better. Okay. Bye, bitch. Here's you later. Here's you later.